Welcome everyone to today's Farm Journal Roundtable for United Ag. Innovation in agriculture healthcare, industry specific benefits management. We've got a really exciting lineup today. My name is Roland Famasi. I am an executive vice president and manager for Rabobank's North American Rabo Research Food and Agribusiness Division, and I'll be your moderator. So today we've got some really important objectives for everyone. First and foremost is to obtain firsthand knowledge from experts and industry professionals who will actually share their experiences in developing and implementing innovative healthcare solutions that are specific to the agriculture industry. Second, we'll learn the benefits of those solutions from a produce grower representative's perspective. And lastly, it's all about seeking advice for making improvements in ag healthcare solutions that better suit the unique demands and risks of an agricultural occupation and lifestyle. So we're gonna get right into it. First off, it's important that we meet the esteemed panel today. So let's have each of our panelists actually introduce yourself, please, and give us a, a brief background. That's good. So I'll get started. My name is Kirti Mutatkar. I'm the president and CEO of United Ag. United Ag is an ag trade association, and we represent the health, wellness, and empathy side of agriculture. Thanks, Gertie. AJ? Yeah, Roland, thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm happy to be here. My name is AJ Sisney. I am the general manager for Rancho Guadalupe. We are a vegetable and berry growing operation here on the central coast of California. And I am also the current board chairman of the board of directors for United Act. Thank you. Thanks, AJ. And David. Thank you, Roland. My name is David Nixarian, president and CEO of Nixarian Insurance Services Incorporated. We're an independent insurance agency specializing in agricultural group health benefits headquartered in Monterey, California. Thank you. Thanks to all of you for being part of this today. And again, thanks to all of you joining us uh, for this, this great discussion we're going to have. I want to remind everyone that as we're going through the roundtable today, please enter any questions you might have. You'll see a place to enter your questions on the right of your screen, because after we go through a, a roundtable discussion, we'll actually be going back to the panel uh, so that they can answer the questions that you submit today. So just a reminder about that. Okay. So first, we'll hear from our panel expert, Curdy, about the current situation with agriculture health care and the need for innovative solutions. After that, we'll open it up to the panel to discuss their professional experience with healthcare solutions in the agriculture industry. So, Curdy, take it away, please. Thank you, Roland. That was a great introduction. And it's interesting when you talk about innovation and healthcare innovation and agriculture, we actually wanted to bring innovation to agriculture. That's, that's our goal, right? Uh, but when we were doing this, what we realized happened was we bought, brought ag to innovation. So when we are in, uh, we have a health innovation, innovation pilot program that we work with. And when we introduced agriculture, to the innovative companies in Silicon Valley that not even part of agriculture. And this is one of the most important industries, one of the essential industries. And really, this, this is the industry that feeds the nation and the world, right? And people tend to ignore that. So what we want to do through United Ag is not just to bring the innovation solutions in healthcare to agriculture, but at the same time, give agriculture the recognition it truly deserves, right? So when next time a Silicon startup is thinking of healthcare, thinking of innovative solutions, they think of us first and say, how do we meet the needs of this industry? That's unique it's in itself, right? Uh, so we had a couple that we worked over the last couple, uh, two or three years. Every time this startup company in California, where Agriculture is one of the most important industries, comes in and meets our employers and meets our members. They have this aha moment and they say, this is agriculture. This is how the employers in agriculture treat their members and their employees. 
and they are just it's amazing so that is what i find is uh that I, I get energized by that. This is what we're trying to do. So we, through that, we brought in behavioral health to our membership. We brought in innovative diabetic solutions. So what we do want to do through United Ag is increase access to care, taking care in areas that has been hard to reach uh, through our telemedicine programs, and generally bring in innovation to this industry that we so love and so admire. Well, Curdy, thank you for that. Uh, it, it just it reminds me that many people don't understand that agricultural producers out there absolutely recognize the value of their employees and want to do the right thing. Sometimes they just need to learn new and innovative ways how to do it and, and be introduced to that. So th this is exciting and you know, it's the reason, reason we're here today. So that's much, much appreciated. So now we'll go around the virtual table and we're gonna hear participants discuss various things, including their business experience with healthcare solutions that are unique to the demands of the ag industry. We'll hear about their experience working with ag specific healthcare solutions providers and consultants, and also get their opinion on how healthcare can be more accessible. So let's get right into my first question here uh, for the panel. Give us some examples of unique and innovative healthcare programs specific to the ag industry. So you, uh, so I'll get started. Uh, we actually brought in telemedicine and we've heard so much uh, out there now about telemedicine. So we introduced this in 2015. And when we introduced this to agriculture in 2015, I remember everybody said, this is something that ag will not use. And what we realized happened was our employers and our membership, you, the utilization has been higher than anywhere else in other industries. So that's amazing, right? Uh, our employees in the fields have access directly. They can call, get their, their uh, healthcare ne uh, needs met. So that's, that's been a really good uh, benefit that we've offered. And when the pandemic hit in March, we brought in behavioral health because that is one thing that was gets missed all the time. And there's an extreme need of that in agriculture. And we actually put in, in our entire innovation budget and offered that free of charge to all our membership and their dependents because we felt that was that important. Behavioral health is the most important crisis actually in the nation right now and in agriculture. And we wanted to address that. And we also have regional health and wellness centers through that we do do any COVID related testing. We do now the vaccination rollout will happen through our health and wellness centers. And that serves like a building our relationship with the community uh, and our industry. Wow. Uh, that's excellent. Excellent examples of unique and innovative healthcare programs. David, you want to uh, give that one a shot? Uh, some examples of unique and innovative healthcare programs that you've seen or implemented? Sure, and it's important to uh, to note uh, that agriculture workers are, have a very unique situation and, and very unique needs. And uh, I've worked in the agricultural health industry for over 40 years, and in that time I've worked with uh, as a broker representing the employer. And um, I have worked with both ag association carriers as well as commercial carriers, and there definitely has been a difference. I found that the Ag Association health plans provide the best result as they have the, the knowledge, the tools, the experience, and they've developed programs especially unique to, the, to meet the needs of agriculture. We see programs such as uh, private health and wellness centers, uh, Mexico panel programs that you would never find with a commercial insurance company. Also, too, we find the Ag Association health plans are, uh, they're, because they're nonprofit, that translates into better pricing than the commercial carriers. Well, that, that makes sense for sure. A AJ, how about you? Innovative healthcare programs that uh, you've been able to implement or that you've seen out there? Yeah, thanks, Roland. Um, I think Kirti mentioned it. Um, there were some programs that uh, once the pandemic struck that came to the forefront, but they were programs that were being worked on ahead of that. Um, from the employer's perspective, we were working with uh, United Ag in this case on uh, behavioral health. 
Um, and obviously once the pandemic struck, that became something that was, was critical, uh, really critical for a lot of people. Um, you know, another innovative solution, quite frankly, is, is the ability to utilize the local health and wellness center. Um, a lot of what we do is anchored from there. And a lot of the programs that we put forth with our employees is anchored at the health and wellness center. So absolutely. A lot, a lot of good stuff going on. Got it. Absolutely. So let's, let's kind of take some of these examples that you've been talking about and let's think about cost effectiveness for a second. You know, what do cost effective programs look like and how can you attract and retain employees with them? So David, let's start with you. Sure. So the best and, and, and the, the most cost-effective programs out there are those that incentivize employees to take action, especially if that action saves both the employee and the insurance company win, uh, money. A win-win situation is always going to be successful for all parties. For example, offering employees a zero copay for primary care clinics and telemedicine will incentivize employees to get medical conditions dealt with earlier again, because there's no cost, before they grow into a costly uh, item, such as a stroke or a heart attack. Also, this can eliminate costly visits to the emergency room of a hospital. It's important to note, although zero copay sounds impressive, and it is, it's interesting to note that primary care is actually a relatively small part of the healthcare dollar, usually consistently, easily less than 10%. At the same time, this can result in some very large savings by getting the treatment sooner than later. Agriculture is dealing with the labor shortage in many areas. So having a health plan that meets, that provides benefits that specifically meets the needs of employees will go a long way to be able to attract and retain employees. Absolutely. Curdy or AJ, do you have anything to add about cost effectiveness and how that helps to attract and retain uh, employees out there. I, you, I can go first and then AJ. Um, no, Kirti, go ahead, this is all you. So one, one of the things that we also do, uh, we are, like when I talk about innovation and bringing the companies into agriculture, we are looking at all the chronic conditions, for example, diabetes, right? And really going deeper into that because these chronic conditions end up cost are costly and how do you bring that cost down? So the big part of what we do at United Ag is increasing access to care, but making it affordable for an employer and the employee, right? So it, it has to be everybody, it has to be the right care, it has to be access to care, and it has to be cheaper for the employee and for the employer. And how do you do that? We also do uh, a big part of United Ag is building relationship with our brokers as David, with our members as AJ, and partnering with them. So we are a partner. We are not just a health plan comes in, or you're stuck with the renewal or whatever it is at your end. We actually partner with them, dig deeper into the data and say, what, what does it look like? What can we help you with? How can we help your employees have a better wellness program that we bring the cost of this healthcare down together? Because the goal is also to bring the cost of healthcare down, not necessarily who pays for it, right? Sometimes the, the conversation gets lost on who pays for it. That's not as important to us. The more important part is how do we bring this entire cost of healthcare down, right? That, that's unsustainable, the way it's working today. Absolutely, absolutely. A AJ, anything to add around uh, the, the cost effectiveness discussion? Yeah, just a couple of things. Uh, thank you, Roland. Um, I think for us, it's important that we take away as many barriers to that access that Kirti spoke about. Uh, one of the ways we can do that is, is as employees become eligible for the health benefits, um, we provide it at a very low cost. We really try to eliminate the barrier uh, to gaining those benefits and to getting that access that Kirti spoke about. Um, it's not just smart, it's deeply ingrained in our culture and the culture of the company. Um, you know, it's a win-win for everybody. I think uh, David spoke of the win-win. Um, you know, the workforce, our employees have access to high quality health care. Um, they're able to address their needs. Um, and 
anyone that has access to that type of care is going to be there to perform for the business and they're going to go home safe and healthy to their families. So it's, it's, it's a win-win. It's really not complicated. Yeah, absolutely. That's right. It, it sounds like a real balancing act between uh, keeping costs down for everybody and the cost of general health, health care down. Um, and, and I think very importantly, and, and you all touched on this, it's about keeping employees healthy uh, so that they can get back to their families. So well said. Appreciate that very much, very much. Now, of course, this last uh, 10 or so months, and I'm, I'm spitballing there, but we know that COVID-19 has changed a lot of things, absolutely changed a lot of things. So as we think about the impact, um, you know, how did, what, it, what impact would you say that COVID-19 uh, has had on employees and how were you able to address those types of challenges? And AJ, let's start with you. Yeah, thank you. Um, as we all know, the world changed. Um, in almost an instant, um, and it did here uh, in our company as well. Um, when that first happened, I think fear set in, and I think fear was on everyone's mind. And honestly, we were uh, it, issues we, we thought were critical coming into that didn't seem so critical anymore. We kind of went into a continuity of business mindset, and with that, um, you know, the thing that went right to the top is the, is the safety of the employees in the company. Um, you know, at the time, it was very difficult to access testing. It was very difficult to get results turned around quickly. Uh, and we realized this very quickly. And we, we reached out to set up a partnership uh, with the United Ag Health and Wellness Center and the local hospitals lab, um, which had state-of-the-art equipment. And, you know, fortunately, they had just put that equipment in place and they were able to turn results quickly. So we were we went aggressively after that. Uh, we went aggressively to make sure that that testing happened, that the employees uh, did not pay for any of it, and that um, we removed all barriers uh, to them letting us know um, that they didn't feel well, um, you know, like making sure they were compensated while they uh, stayed at home awaiting test results and, and the like. So again, it was about removing all the barriers to make sure that we could get people um, in and tested right away. Um, trace if necessary, test them, quarantine crews, um, have people quarantine at home, um, have people work at home with, with a laptop, um, whatever. To, you know, um, We also engaged a couple of local health professionals to make sure that we could bounce any of these, uh, I guess, any of the ideas that we had around the protocol that we were trying to set up internally. So, you know, it was, it was a partnership. It was, um, it was a team internally that worked closely with the health and wellness center worked closely with um, the laboratory uh, as well as um, a couple of doctors, one who specifically specialized in infectious disease. So um, it was all hands on deck um, and we're really proud of what we were able to put together. And I think we were very effective with it. Thanks AJ. Curdy, how about you? I mean, AJ gave a, a very good firsthand example of that. What other impacts uh, have you seen that COVID-19 had on employees? So what I realized during COVID-19 is what we have been doing in the last couple of years to do uh, come to fruition. Because I help in what we have with AJ, what we have with David, it's all about going back to relationships, right? So engaging, 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 and building that trust. Uh, because AJ as a member or David as a broker has to have the trust that United Ag is doing what they're doing for the right reasons, right? So we've spent the years kind of building that trust with each other. So when that hit, AJ could just pick up the phone and say, hey, I really need this help. And the employees also feel that trust that it's not a health plan looking for their own interest versus let's partner together. Let's bring the best thing that's uh, accessible for our employees, right? So I, I felt that was so critical. And I, when AJ said he feels proud, I feel proud that we could do that because it was so important because 
uh, there was that trusting relationship that we had with everyone that we could bank on and take things forward. Even the behavioral health issue that came up, right? So we heard issues that were going on, the fear set in, fear set in, anxiety set, set, in, set in, stress set in. And so we grouped together and said, okay, what can we do for this? And let's offer this for free. Let, let's see what happens. So, uh, and that was, that was needed. So all that I was really... Uh, what COVID brought out was the power of human connection. I actually feel, and I get a little goose because that's, that was so important when, especially we were so detached from each other, so remote. And that actually came to the forefront and how important that was for me personally and from a United Bank standpoint. Well, it's, it's so refreshing to hear these kind of success stories. Absolutely. And the amount of cooperation uh, that that it takes and that everyone's, you know, willing to take on to get uh, to get a positive outcome. Much appreciated, David. Any anything you want to add uh, around COVID nineteen? Uh, sure, uh, Roland. So, you know, here uh, a good example is you know when we had the fires here in California, um, most people really didn't know what their fire insurance covered. But when their house burned down, boy, do they want to pull out that policy and look. And so it was the same with health, with COVID. A lot of people just maybe they were given their their uh, summary of benefits and coverage, but just kind of glanced over it. But we did get a lot of calls from, from employees, employers. How does this plan work? Uh, what's my maximum out of pocket? Trying to get their arms around it. It was definitely frustrating because uh, people were looking to us for answers and we just didn't have them. Uh, we just didn't have the answers because... This was new for everybody. The whole country has never gone through this kind of uh, situation. So what we would do as the information came out, we were getting it to our members. A lot of times uh, uh, when the carrier would send it out, we would make sure the client received it and resend it again. Uh, and, and so we were just there for them. Uh, we were just there to help wherever we could. Definitely was, it's been a challenging time, especially in the beginning where there was such a lack of answers. Sure, but I, the will, the willingness, the cooperation of, of so many people, including you know, the three of you, for example, um, has has really come to the forefront uh, over this past year. And 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 as I said earlier, it's it's great to hear success stories uh, like this, and and the amount of cooperation and coordination and willingness uh, for everybody to learn together. Absolutely. And David, I'm going to come right back to you. And I, I, I hate to bring up costs again, right? But a, uh, I'm an economist, so um, I think about costs a lot. Right. So how are you looking to bring healthcare costs down with innovative programs? Sure. I think engaging the employee can get us, uh, to use your phrase, success story. We definitely can do that and bring down healthcare costs. Employees with major medical conditions or what you call comorbidities represents the largest share of healthcare costs. Helping employees in this category can help lower costs, reduce absenteeism, and more importantly, to reduce the employee's pain and suffering. For the rest of the employees, stressing the importance of routine annual physicals, preventive testing, such as routine lab work, colonoscopies, mammograms, et cetera, can also be very, very cost effective. When it comes to routine physicals and preventive testing, there's many success stories. And it's because these big ticket items, uh, cholesterol, diabetes, high blood pressure, um, breast cancer, colon cancer, they're called the silent killers for a reason. It's because there's usually no symptoms until it's too late. However, if it's caught early, they can very successfully be treated. When it comes to a person's health, an ounce of prevention, it's not worth a pound of cure, it's worth a ton of cure. Well said, well said, exactly. Curdy, Curdy, did you wanna add something? No, I, I agree. I think that uh, the, what I was saying with uh, some of these chronic conditions and bringing wellness to the uh, forefront really, really helps. And through our health and wellness centers, we want to build relationships with the communities in general. 
and uh, help them uh, doing that at uh, the post covid world when we actually can kind of go and uh, spend some time and get to know i'm looking forward to that um so uh, yeah that that definitely does and from uh, I, i know this is general topic but you from a united act standpoint just from a financial standpoint since i have a financial background before i became a ceo the all of this when you really look at it even helps uh it's a very financially sustainable model where everybody gets benefited right so we we have done well at united act that helps because then that gets goes back and we are a non-profit so it goes back into the members and we've been able to keep our rate increases lower at the same time employees who get the care is the quality care access to care and all that so our focus is united act is focused on that that's our sole focus on kind of working it out and making it affordable Sure. So that makes perfect sense. AJ, anything that you want to add from an actual agricultural producer's perspective around being innovative to keep costs down? Yeah, well, I think the the main point is to make sure that uh, that preventative care happens. Um, and in a lot of cases, uh, people don't even know that they're facing an issue uh, before they do something like uh, we've done here recently with a biometric screening clinic. We, uh, we were fortunate to have about 110 uh, of the employees go through the, the bio- biometric screening, which was supported by the Health and Wellness Center. Um, and I can tell you, um, in, in many cases, it resulted in, because they shared with me personally, it resulted in calls to their doctor right away, right? It was something that they did not have planned. So that's important. I mean, we, uh, like I said earlier, um, it's about uh, making sure that as many of the employees get the benefits um, and then doing everything you can uh, to make sure that they have access to, uh, to the preventative, to the preventative measures. Um, and we do that constantly. Um, whether it's the flu shot clinics, uh, like I said, the biometric screening, and those are available to everyone in the company, whether they take the benefits or not. So that's something that is important to us. So uh, it's, at every angle, we're, we're doing our best. Sure. Roland, to add to AJ's point, so what we do is we uh, do biometric screening, help with that, and our chief medical officer actually analyzes that data and then comes up with a customized plan for the members. That helps with that. That's, uh, that has helped AJ's uh, group and others. And what I've noticed is when uh, AJ is a, uh, her has Rancho Guadalupe is an amazing employer because they are em- em- employee centric, right? So when you're employee centric, what happens is actually it works in your favor because your cost of healthcare comes down. When you're the other way around, it's usually harder. So we I, we've seen successful employers who have been successful in bringing the cost of healthcare down are the companies like Health Rancho Guadalupe, who are so invested in their employees and their wellness. And that overall helps. Yeah, if you don't mind, just really quick, um, you know, the, the cynical employer always says, you know, when are these additional costs going to stop? When are, you know, what more do we have to do? Um, you know, I think that the employer that is, is engaged in, in the health and wellness of their workforce um, says, what can we do next? Yeah. What more can we do? Um, so it, it never stops. It never ends. Just wanted to put that up. And it gives back. It gives back to the employers. Uh, it's actually, it's a, it helps on the income statement too. <laughs> because being, being sure. employee centric. Yeah. <laughs> and I think when we talk about innovation, it's a natural part of innovation is there's always a what's next, right? I mean, there's always going to be another step, something new. And basically the task is never done. On the biometric screenings, AJ was just mentioning, um, we had a client that this was done for, uh, 250 employees, and I um, can't remember the exact number, but they, they did, a, they did a, a survey before they did the screenings. Uh, employees would take the survey and say, do you suffer from any of these following? High blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes. And so like the number might have been 50 people or, or, or 25 people said, yes, I have high blood pressure. They do the screenings and then they the employer gets a one combined total of everybody with no names, of course, to be HIPAA compliant, but a grand total. And it showed there was like 75 people with high blood pressure. So there was 50 people that during the screenings were told they have high blood pressure that didn't know it. 
And that's not just for blood, high blood pressure, it's for cholesterol, for all these other categories. And to me, that's just so powerful on dealing with trying to help control causes. You first have to identify them and that's huge. Wow. Oh, the insights from the three of you, I mean, the depth of the insights here, you know, for me, I, I'm, I'm trying to sum it up into a, a few words, right? And, and what comes to mind is employee centric and innovation and prevention. And, and those are the things that come to mind and, and really appreciate the comments. So we've already touched on the fringes of, of this just naturally in the conversation, but to kind of put more of a point on it here, you know, we've got a unique panel today and, and I, it makes me think that there, there are three different perspectives of ag healthcare, right? There's the insurance broker and the employer and the employee. And if we could discuss for a second, how do their needs differ? I mean, how do you reconcile that? How do you think about that? Uh, David, let's start with you. Sure. Well, the role of the broker is to keep the employer informed and compliant with the many laws and regulations for health plans. Things such as eligibility rules to avoid the, for large employers, to avoid, avoid the PPACA employer share responsibility penalty, the so-called uh, play or pay penalty. Or large employers, for example, must provide their employees these uh, forms. They're called 1095C forms. Uh, that's another example. So our job as broker is to take the responsibility to make sure the employer is trained, he gets the task done correctly, meets the deadlines on some things like the 1095C, meeting the deadline to file it with the IRS is, is, is almost 95% uh, of compliance because they're right now saying good faith compliance counts. And, and so, and of course, as the broker, we help with routine service needs, which was during COVID-19 in the beginning, especially that's what we were doing is routine servicing needs. The ongoing challenge of the employer is to find improved and innovative approaches to engage with employees. Again, especially those who have multiple comorbidities. Uh, and when I say comorbidities, just make sure we're on the same page. Um, it's things such as high blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes, and, and obesity. And when we talk about the last one, we don't mean someone just 10 or 20 pounds overweight. Usually it's 100 pounds over their target weight or 100%. And usually when someone has that kind of a weight issue along with it, then unfortunately they'll have high blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes, often all of those, and maybe another issue in addition. And so you'll see people with four and five of these comorbidities. The issue is the challenge is for the employer and the broker to help with the employer to find new approaches to address these challenges. Thanks, David. I appreciate it. AJ, how about you? When you think about the different roles involved, the different players, uh, how, do you, how do you think about the different perspectives, um, say employer-employee perspectives? Well, Roland, I think, uh, you know, I, I touched on it a little bit earlier. Um, you know, for us, it's about making sure that, you know, as many of the employees, you know, take the benefits as possible. Um, but that by itself isn't enough. Obviously, we, we need to make sure that the benefits that we're putting in front of them are, are quality, um, uh, high quality benefits. Um, and we believe we have that. Um, you know, again, the cynical employer might say, gosh, you know, look at, look at the invoice, the monthly invoice, because of how many people have taken the benefits. See, we want 100%. We want every single person to take them. You know, if, if every person in the company took the health benefits and say the 401k took advantage of that, um, that's where we want to be. Um, so it's, it's, it's our job to, to put that information in front of everybody. It's our job to partner with the right healthcare provider. Um, and together, you know, it's, it, that's everything. Sure. No, it's it, like we talked about earlier, right? It's, it's important for things like, like retention, but at the end of the day, it's, it's about making people's lives better. Curti, anything you want to add on the, the different perspectives? 
So for my, so when I, I always talk about empathy, that's a word I use all the time. And the way I define empathy is putting myself in your shoes, right? So do you understand what you're looking for? And do I understand your needs? So when, uh, when you focus from an employee standpoint, so we spend a lot of time understanding that employee base uh, and saying, who are we actually the health plan? Who's using this health plan and where does it go? Including culture awareness, including your language, including what are the real needs of these employees? So we really, really focus on that. And uh, again, going from an employer, like I talk about like AJs uh, of the world. <laughs> so I, we also focus on that because that's again, really important because they are again, that's a combination of employee employer and doing that. So we partner with them to provide that, that help to their employees or provide that access to the uh, employees. And we also actually really hold a really important, the relationship that we have with our service reps. So when uh, David called them, he calls them brokers. That's the word out there. But the reason we actually call them service reps is this is a service industry. We're servicing our employers. We're servicing our members and it's the service that they offer. And so we hold that as important too. So it's a, it's a partnership. So the event, Eventually, the person who needs that care, who's actually going to walk into the health and wellness center, who has issues, gets addressed because of all of us combining and doing that. Even from, just to give you an example, even when they call a member services, it could be somebody calling from Salinas and they could have had a fire and they don't want to talk about anxiety issues, but they want to talk about fire issues and all the things. We let our member services talk to them for hours. We we make them feel okay because that's important to us, right? Serving that member employee at the core. And then how do we all partner together to make sure that employee gets taken care of? Service oriented and flexible. Yep. yep. I love that. <laughs> yes. I love that. Thanks, Kirchie. Before, uh, I've got a couple more questions for the panelists. Uh, but before that, I, I want to remind everyone that's, that's listening today, please enter your questions that you might have for the panelists in the question and answer uh, area to the right of your screen so that we can uh, have the panelists address your questions here in just a moment. So just a, that was just a quick, quick reminder. Well, one of the other things that, uh, that I think we should have on our minds and ask, ask you all this is, why is it is having a health and wellness center specifically for ag industry employees important? Let's let's talk about that for a second. AJ, do you want to take that first? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> um, I think it's been you know talked about a little bit already, but uh, you know access uh, is everything, and um, you know the local health and wellness center. Um, our our employees can can walk in. Um, and so that's a big deal. Um, staff is bilingual, um, and they're looking to uh, uh, they're looking beyond you know the the reason the person perhaps presented that day, and looking beyond at their wellness, you know, beyond just that uh, the reason they walked in the door. Um, <clears throat> you know, going back to the previous point, we talked about or I talked about regarding how we addressed uh, when COVID nineteen popped up and the pandemic took hold. Um, Without having the health and wellness center, we would not have been able to establish that testing platform. And it was, it was quite a remarkable thing because while <clears throat> you can send out an email, a text, a flyer, or have a tailgate meeting on, you know, where the health and wellness center is um, until someone, you know, actually sees it, needs it, and goes to it, um, they don't know it's where it's at. And uh, so, you know, the silver lining, I'll, I'll go with that on, on COVID-19 was that uh, you know, the aggressive um, testing program that we did put people at that health and wellness center. And they now knew uh, for the next time they needed it, where to go. And, you know, we sent um, that affiliation, uh, you know, with the health and wellness center uh, worked for everybody because it wasn't just those who took the benefits because we were sending employees there that did not take the benefits to get tested. So um, it, it worked. Um, it's also, as I, I said a little while ago, the anchor of some of our outreach programs, um, you know, like the biometric screening. I mean, they support it there from the health and wellness center. So um, it, uh, it's, not just a, it's not just a good thing. It, it, at this point, I'd say it's a necessary thing. Mm -hmm. Got it. Got it. Appreciate it. Kurti, what about when you think about the importance of 
wellness centers that are specific for ag industry employees? Uh, I feel for ag industry, as opposed to when you have other urgent cares and stuff, it's a relationship building and understanding our culture, because that's unique. Uh, to give you an example, this was in our Turlock Health and Wellness Center. Somebody walked in during, this was during COVID time, had some other issue, uh, but uh, took care of it, but was anxious because of what's going on out, outside. And this person on a Saturday, the provider from the Health and Wellness Center reached out to make sure, are you okay? Because when you walked in that day, you were a little anxious. I just wanted to follow up with you to just to make sure, are you okay? And just that call, that that was enough for this person, right? I, I, it's that's so basically that's the relationship building and in the community that you form those relationships that happen. Uh, th- those are the stories we're trying to create through health and wellness centers. Oh, it, it's it's refreshing to to hear success stories like that. Thank you, David. Anything you want to add around the, these wellness centers? Sure. Um, so. Th- I think the key thing, in addition to what's been said, is is it's a private mm-hmm. center. It's private. It's your own. So if you're covered by the health plan, by the United Ag Plan, this is your own private clinic, your private health and wellness center. So instead of going to a place where, you know, there's uh, a long wait, there's uh, people you've never seen, you see a different person every time. That's not the way these work. They're they're small on purpose to build that relationship that Kurti mentioned. And so you walk in and you see the same person, the same medical assistant, the same provider every time, other than the week or two they're out on vacation. And so it's just, it's uh, it's very powerful and it's going back to the old days, the old days of a family doctor in a small town. And there was just one doctor. And I think, some of us could actually remember that, okay? And there's only one doctor city with 2,000 population or 1,500. And there's just one doctor. And everybody knew that doctor. And it was kind of powerful. When you'd walk in, he knew your history. He knew the family connection. He knew what your family history was. It was powerful. That's what the Health and Wellness Center can do. It duplicates that, but brings it with a modern-day approach with all of the the high tech record keeping and access and all of that. And so it's the best of all worlds. And we also, what we want to do Roland is one of the things we recognize in agriculture is uh, you don't want people absent from work, right? Not because the employer requires them to, but as an employee, they don't want to do that either. So when we introduce telemedicine or the health and wellness centers, we very much keep an eye on that. So there's zero wait time at most of our health and wellness centers. They actually walk in at the most 15, 20 minutes if you make an appointment, but we don't want to have somebody going into the, uh, what happens to all of us, you go to a doctor's office, the four hour deal, the doctor sees you for five minutes and the rest is just waiting outside or in your gown inside for a couple hours. So it's, so we wanted to just get rid of all that and make sure we get them back and at work and uh, working or doing whatever they need to taking care of themselves. No, oh, that absolutely. It resonates with me. I, I, what, what, what both of you just said, because, you know, it, unless I want to wait for four hours, then uh, I'm not going to see my normal doctor, like David described, that knows the family, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's going to be somebody else. So th- these are tremendous, tr- tremendous successes and, and appreciated. Curry, I'm going to come right back to you and, and, and you know, you're, you're probably maybe best position to answer this one. How does United Ag approach their relationship with their customers? So this is actually a a good question because that's the core of who we are at United Ag, the relationships and learning that. So we focus a lot on building relationships and engaging with our members and building the trust and not just with employers and but every the uh, even the employees all right so we do a different programs with them building the trust engaging with them because i think that's at the core of access especially healthcare that's so personal right it's very personal and the other thing we do is we've done we take experiences from everything that's failed for somebody outside uh when you go through care the one i was just talking about the doctor's office was based on what i had to uh all of us have to go through right so it's so 
frustrating, you come back and you do that. So taking examples, listening to our employee, the members, understanding what issues they might be dealing with, building that trust, and again, partnering with them to bring better solutions. That's, that's at the core of, I'm always says, don't tell me the good things that happen. Tell me what's not working out and then let's solve for it. Right. Right. Before we move on, anything, David or AJ, that you want to add? All right. All right. No, that one, that one was, was, was perfect for Curdy. unless <laughs> one of you has any comments. Much appreciated. No, she's, per as you said, perfectly positioned to answer that one. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so this is, this is definitely one I think that all of you could maybe give some brief feedback on. But if we, we think five years ahead, what does the ideal ag industry healthcare look like five years from now? Whoever wants to start, please. I'll jump in. Um, you know, I think uh, that's a that's a question that could be made. Uh, you know, the answer could be really complicated, or it can be. I'm going to go with the, the simple approach, and I'm going to sound a little bit like a broken record from what we've been talking about. But um, you know, I would say I like the road that we're currently on. Um, I like uh, that we are, as an employer, doing what we can to provide um, the access to to quality healthcare. Uh, that we are partnering with. Uh, a healthcare provider that is, um, you know, innovative in their thinking and making sure that we have access to a health and wellness center and that we're able to uh, be proactive, um, getting out to, to our employees and, and, uh, and making sure that they're thinking and, and engaging in their health and wellness with, you know, again, back to the, the biometric screenings. Um, so I think that, um, you know, some of the new innovative products that have come along, the, the telemedicine, um, whether it's, you know, seeing a, a, a physician because you have a sore throat or it's um, the behavioral health angle, which I think a lot of people are in need of right now. So I think you can, you can see the future right now unfolding. And I think you just don't look any further than what's happening right in front of us. So that's my, that's my take. Very good. Uh, AJ, just uh, tagging along that, I, I, uh, I agree the telemedicine is going to be definitely a bigger thing. And I think we're going to see it go past primary care to specialists and, and to many, many other branches of uh, providers. I think we're going to see a successful program will have a lot of employee engagement. I think first, uh, I'll talk about those with comorbidities, which you've, that's been my buzzword throughout this whole presentation. Um, during COVID-19, we have heard that phrase a lot. Uh, we, uh, another way you hear it is underlying health conditions. You read about in the newspaper, a, uh, a, a person 25, year old, pass, uh, 25 years old passed away from COVID-19. Wait a minute, I thought the, it was very, the death rate was low. It's, it's very, very small for people in their 20s. But you read into the article, but the person had underlying health conditions or comorbidities. The death rate for someone with no comorbids was 0.20 versus uh, uh, 10 times higher for those with five or more comorbidities. And so wow. definitely having programs that engage employees where they're willing to work with the carrier to help with uh, disease management, to try to get the comorbidities under control and reduces, I think, really going to be helpful. And the second, of course, is those who don't have any comorbidities. Uh, you'll have a high percentage of those employees and dependents have had a routine physical, have had the related testing, such as uh, blood work, mammograms as scheduled. And, and, and so between those two, you would have a situation where people are getting treatment where needed. And of course that would lower costs and again, reduce pain and suffering. Thanks David, uh, appreciate it. Uh, Kurti, how about you? Uh, ideal healthcare system for ag in five years. I feel the, what, what based on what we are working on, focusing on uh, bringing the technology aspect of it and leveraging the digital healthcare with the personal connection. 
the incre increasing your member engagement, still having a really keeping a pulse on the member engagement and not losing sight of that when any of these technology uh, products come in, but leveraging both so we can provide better care, more access and uh, make it affordable. We are looking at a diabetic solution launching that in September of this year. That's again going to be a combination of digital versus your human connection, combining the two. How do you, uh, that's that's what, and I, I actually personally feel agriculture that has like what I uh, earlier I was saying has not been recognized as being that innovative or doing that, but that has totally not been my experience. Uh, ag is very innovative always willing to try new new things and for wellness. So that, that's what I see. I, I, I would be surprised if the tech, technology companies would say, oh, why, why didn't we really look at this industry? They're the first to adopt and let, let's take, take them. So that, that's, that's what I see is going to happen. Got it. Got it. So to summarize what the three of you just said, it, for me and for the audience, it sounds like we're already on the right path. Uh, we're, we're seeing some successes. We have to continue to embrace technology. We'll continue to learn together and improve. And uh, But technology can never replace that human touch, that personalization. That's yep. for sure. So I see some questions coming in, but just a quick reminder to the audience, keep keep putting questions in as they, they come to mind. So now for all of you, you've described what the system looks like. What support do you need to get there? Kurti, let's start with you. I, I, AJ said this earlier on in the conversation, the support would be trusting that it's not just a health plan looking for its own uh, bottom line, but it's a health plan looking work, working together and having uh, more employers like an uh, AJ kind of an employer who's really looking at employees. I think I've really stressed that because that does bring uh, care, uh, cost of care down because as soon as you have an employer's engagement with the employees and the wellness of the employees, that goes a long way. Uh, so that would be uh, exciting to see. <laughs> More good. employees engaged that way. AJ or David, what, what, support, uh, what, what support can you think of sure. from, from your angle? No, I would say I, I think it'd be a teamwork approach, definitely to to get to get there. Um, you would have the employer uh, along with the broker and the uh, health carrier, the three of them working to engage and educate and reach out to the employees. Uh, I think is how you get there. Very good, AJ. Anything, Dad? Yeah, um, from the employer's perspective, um, <clears throat> I think that. Uh, you know, the approach has to be top down. Uh, it, it can't just be, you know, the HR and benefits department, are, you know, are going aggressively out to, you know, to put these programs in front of uh, the employees. It has to be, um, you know, from the top. And I'm fortunate uh, in my role to work for, for two owners that absolutely um, live this and believe it. And, uh, you know, I, I just hope in the end that, you um, you know, we're able to show that this is this is a model that can be duplicated. This is a model that works, and uh, you know, hope that the state or federal government doesn't jump in and try to say they can do this better than we can. Um, I think, uh, or I hope that everybody on the call today, um, after what they've heard, feels that this is a model that can work. And uh, so, there's there it is. It's a partnership, as as in teamwork, as as David said. We have to work with our healthcare provider and uh, do what we can for um, for our employees. Absolutely. No, thank you for that. And and look, we've covered a lot of ground today. The, the depth of experience and knowledge that the three of you have is much, much appreciated. And, and I just want to thank you for the great discussion. It's great information, great insights. Now, at this point, we're actually going to be coming back to all of you, but with some Q&A uh, from the audience. Uh, so we will, I'll launch right into that and give you all an opportunity to answer uh, questions or uh, in some cases, 
cover other topics that may not have been addressed during the round table. So let's, uh, let's get right into that. All right, the first question I see here coming from the audience. How is United Ag serving as the model for healthcare in other industries? So the way we're serving as a model uh, for health, uh, healthcare in other industries is what I kind of alluded to uh, previously. Uh, sometimes what happens is when you talk of empathy and you talk about member centricness, it's seen as more of fluff thing where you don't see a financial kind of, is this a financially sustainable model? So when we go out and we either talk either even in Sacramento or DC, uh, when we present and show how this is actually a financially really sustainable model, because we've tripled in size in the last three or four years, we have, we are, we have in, uh, when you talk about revenue, we are around $215 million in contributions. So that in itself talks about kind of the growth that has happened. So financially really sustainable model at the same time, providing affordable care where we've kept our rate increases under the double digits where an employee has access to most of your health and wellness centers and your telemedicine and other benefits at zero copay. So it's it's afford, affordable to the employees as well. So we are really proud. And we uh, even when we go in from innovation standpoint, like I said earlier, a couple of the industries that got exposed to uh, uh, our industry and United Ag were, it was an amazing thing to see uh, uh, the, the light, lights go off and they say, we really need to engage with you and with agriculture. So we're part of quite a few innovation pilot programs that they actively seek us out now. Very good. I, I want to remind the audience, look, we, there's, there's a lot of great questions. The questions we don't have time or a chance to answer uh, live today, we'll, we'll actually uh, be be answering via email. So we'll get responses back to you um, either today uh, or by email. So next question coming through, what advice would you give a human resources benefits management person who is evaluating healthcare programs for employees who work in agriculture occupations? Whoever wants to take that first. That seems like a David question. <laughs> it does. It does. I agree. So I, I think our, the advice we would have is first go to get a broker involved. Um, you want a broker representing you because um, we find even our largest clients who have thousands of employees still rely on us for compliance and eligibility training. And it's because no matter how big they are, you still need the advice and assistance of someone who's experienced and who's working it full time. So my first advice would be to the HR manager, find a broker who knows ag benefits and is doing it full time, meaning they're not involved with other types of products and insurances and different types. They're strictly doing group health insurance. They're out there. And those out there are the ones that are the truly knowledgeable and able to help. That would probably be my biggest uh, piece of advice I would give uh, an HR manager. And, and outside of that, definitely as they're looking for options, they definitely want to consider one of those should be an Ag Association health plan. Because as I mentioned at the beginning, they're tailor-made, organized by and operated organized for and operated by people in agriculture. And they truly understand agricultural needs. And so I think that's, that's really an important thing. Well, it sounds like solid advice, that's for sure. Look, everyone, we're, we're out of time for today. Uh, I wanna thank the, the what, a, what a terrific panel. Uh, Kurti, thank you, David, AJ, great insights today. I wanna thank everyone who's joined us today for this panel. I want to thank the Farm Journal and um, look forward to, uh, to having more discussions like this in the future. Thanks for being with us and have a wonderful rest of the day. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Roland. Thank that you, Roland. Fun discussion. Thank you. Yeah.